Howdy, welcome back. If you're not tired of worms yet, you probably will be after this discussion. Um, we're gonna talk about nematodes today. So we've already covered our flat worms, which were covered in your last exam, the platyhomenthes. And we've also talked about the annelids, which was in our last lecture, or the segmented worms. And in this lecture, we're gonna talk about our round worms, or nematodes. And before we get started, I just wanna give you guys a fair warning. Um, some of the material here can be a bit uh gross so if you're squeamish in any way or you get kind of sick to your stomach um please prepare yourself um feel free to cover up any images that are just a little too gross to handle um, because some of these do cause some pretty nasty infections in animals so uh some of the pictures can be pretty gross i tried to pick ones that weren't as disgusting but i just want to give you guys a warning so with that said Let's get into our lecture on nematodes. This is chapter 18 of your textbook. Before we get into nematodes, I wanna take some time talking about the larger group that nematodes fit within. And this group is called Ecdysozoa. And Ecdysozoa is a classification for organisms that undergo a process called ecdysis or molting. And that just basically means that they have an outer cuticle layer that they must shed in order to grow. So throughout different stages of their development or as they're growing from juveniles to an adult or getting to be a larger adult, they must first shed this outer layer in order to uh, get to the next stage. And this shedding is sometimes facilitated by the production of a hormone called a disone, and that will kind of start this process of molting and shedding. There are many organisms that fit within the Dysozoa. Uh, there's a lot of different body plans. These organisms are very, very different, but some that you're gonna be familiar with if you're not already familiar with are nematodes, which we're covering in this lecture, and then uh, tardigrades or little sea bears, and then uh, arthropods. And arthropods includes all of our insects and crustaceans and various other organisms that fit within those groups. And so I included two images here of molting. And so we have a nematode here that's molting, it's shedding its outer cuticle. The uh, organism actually stops here. So this all down to this area, like keep going down this way, is the actual nematode. This uh, region up here is the shed outer cuticle. So the uh, nematode is basically retracting itself out of this uh, old cuticle so that it can grow. And then we also have uh, an example on this side of an insect molting its old skin, shedding its old school skin so it can grow or develop um, in some way. So we'll talk a lot more about molting and shedding when we get into arthropods because we're gonna spend several weeks talking about arthropods. Um, I personally don't like looking at things that are molted, so I will try my best to show the most tame pictures possible. <laughs> On to the main topic of this lecture, nematodes, often referred to as roundworms. Nematodes slash roundworms, same thing, are really ubiquitous, like they're everywhere. Um, from freshwater, saltwater, terrestrial, um, inside organisms, outside on organisms. They are in plants and animals. They're in warm areas, cold areas, even in the Arctic, um, even in the deep sea. Like nematodes are everywhere. They are extremely prevalent and very, very diverse group of organisms. They are pseudocelomates which means that they have a coelom, but their coelom is only lined by mesodermal tissue on one side of their coelom. And this coelom helps to make their hydrostatic skeleton, which is similar to what we talked about, a hydrostatic skeleton in annelids, but the way that they use this skeleton for locomotion is very different from what we see in annelids. And we'll talk about that in a, a couple slides. The roundworms are cylindrical in shape, hence round worms, and they're eutelic. So that means that all the adults of a particular uh, group, so this particular species and that particular species, have a defined number of cells, uh, somatic cells as adults. So you don't see one adult of one of the species having uh, 100 somatic cells and another one having 150. That you don't see that in, in them. No matter how big or small they are, they all have the same number of uh, somatic cells. 
Roundworms lack cilia or flagella, and this includes even with their sperm. And we'll talk about what they do as far as sperm go um, and later in this uh, section because they don't have flagella. They have a cuticle, as I mentioned before, because they're ecdysozoan, so they have a cuticle, and but their cuticle is primarily composed of collagen. And they undergo ecdysis, um, so they shed that cuticle whenever necessary so they can grow and develop. And their cuticle, because it's made of collagen and the way that the structure of the collagen overlaps, it allows them to uh, be, have a very elastic movement when they're moving. Um, but this collagen cuticle also protects them from the uh, from drying out. It also protects them from their host gut um, juices, digestive juices. It protects them from any type of danger. So it serves two functions, protection and also elasticity. The nematodes have a uh, epidermal labor, layer called the hypodermis, and it's a uh, syncytial epidermis that produces the, the cuticle. So if you don't remember what a syncytia is, please go back to our platyomenthes lecture or back in our developmental lecture to remember what a syncytia is. The uh, nematodes also have a complete digestive tract. So they have a mouth, uh, pharynx, uh, intestine, all the way down to the anus. And you can see that here in this image, uh, mouth, pharynx, intestine, and then the anus all the way back here, okay? Um, they have gland cells and uh, a canal and or a canal system for excretion. So they don't have um, organs specifically for a lot of their functions, actually. They're far more simple than what we saw in annelids. They don't have um, like metanephridia or anything like that for excretion. They have either gland cells or a system of canals. They also don't have any respiratory organs. Um, they undergo respiration via their skin. So they're far more simple. They generally are composed of very, very few um, internal organs in order to survive. Nematodes can survive under both anaerobic and aerobic conditions depending on the species because they have um, different mechanisms to get the energy that they need depending on if it's an anaerobic or aerobic condition. And they also have longitudinal muscles, like we talked about in annelids, they had, annelids had longitudinal and circular muscles. In the case of nematodes, they only have longitudinal muscles. So they only have muscles that run from their anterior end to their posterior end. They don't have muscles that go around the circumference of the organism. And so this impacts how they move. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. Most um, nematodes are either free living or they're parasitic. Um, some of them are carnivorous or saprophytic or coprophytic. Um, carnivorous, obviously they're, they're eating other organisms active hunters. They can be saprophytic, meaning they eat dead or decaying matter. And then they can also be coprophytic, which means that they eat the feces of other organisms. And then on the parasitic side of things, there are nematodes that are both ectoparasites and then some that are endoparasites. And they can be parasites of animals um, and plants. So there's a lot of variety out there when it comes to the lifestyle of a nematode. Some examples um, that you might be familiar with are C. elegans and Ascarius. Um, we'll talk more about Ascarius and some various other types of worms uh, at the very end of this chapter. Locomotion in roundworms is very different from what we saw in annelids. And this is because roundworms only have longitudinal muscle. So they only have muscle that runs from their anterior to their posterior region. They don't have muscles that run their circumference. And this results in a different um, way of projecting themselves forward. So when we look at annelids, they kind of inched forward in a crawling type of way. But when we look at the uh, roundworms, they actually use more of a jerky whip-like type of way to propel themselves forward. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a video at the end of this presentation that'll show you um, a nematode swimming through aquatic media, and you can see how it kind of is very um, wavy type of movement and it's very whip-like in nature. So going back to uh, what these cells look like, the uh, muscle cells in this diagram you can see here as any of this kind of pink flamingo-y type material. So the uh, muscle cells line the body wall, which you can see here as all this pink material. And then they also, this is also here is uh, muscle cells. And so the 
roundworms have four bands of muscle fiber that run their length. They have a section here, you can see, a section here, a section here, and a section here. And each of those bands have, uh, is muscle fiber that is composed of two types of muscle cells. We have our cells that are kind of these smaller cells in this diagram that are closer to the body wall. And these are the spindle cells. Spindle. And these are responsible for locomotion, actually moving the organism from place to place. And then we have these cells here that project themselves into the pseudo seal. And these are our cell bodies. And the cell body is responsible for storing glycogen, but it also houses the nucleus. And so both of these types of cells together um, make up the muscle fibers. Let's get rid of all of this. Okay, there we go. Um, all cells in the uh, roundworms are connected to the nerve cord. And this is unique in um, not just roundworms, it's also present in some other species out there, but it's very rare. And generally when we're talking about the connection between nervous tissue, uh, nerve tissue and muscles, it's the opposite way around. The nerve tissue interacts with the muscles and stimulates them. But in the case of roundworms, it's actually in the reverse. The muscles extend and attach themselves to the nerve cord. And you can see that in this image here. This is the muscle cell, and it has an extension that puts it in contact with the nerve cord. So when we're looking at the movement of uh, roundworms, the cuticle plays a major role because it antagonizes the longitudinal uh, muscle fibers. So when we're talking about the annelids, we talked about how the circular muscle fibers and the longitudinal muscle fibers antagonize each other. But in this case, there's only one type of muscle. So how do we, uh, after the muscles contract and they release, how do we get the organism to return back to its normal state? And we do this in roundworms using the cuticle. So the cuticle on the outside of the organism is made of collagen, as we said before. It's nice and sturdy, but it's also very elastic. Um, imagine like um, some sort of like twig outside, right? Those young twigs, they're sturdy, but they're also able to move around as long as the, the twig is not too old. So when the roundworm is ready to move, it essentially will contract the longitudinal muscles on one side of its body. And this contraction of these muscles will cause the cuticle on the opposite side to kind of stretch apart and that's what it's trying to show you here in this image so let's say the muscles on this side of the organism have been contracted the longitudinal muscles have been contracted which causes the cuticle on this side to also kind of uh, be more compact and then the cuticle on the opposite side will be elongated once those muscles on that side so once the muscles on this side are relaxed the cuticle basically snaps back and uh, will cause the organism to do like this. So we have, let me try to draw it out for you guys. So we have our uh, muscles bend this way. And then once the muscles are relaxed, it'll snap back. And so we end up with something like this. And then if you, if they don't contract again, it'll go back to being normal. But in order to get that whip-like motion, we contract on one side and then relax those muscles, springs back, and then contract, spring back, contract, spring back. So you can see how this is like a sine wave, like a very wavy S curve type of movement. This is all facilitated by a very high hydrostatic pressure in the, in the coelom. So if the hydrostatic pressure within the coelom wasn't extremely high in roundworms, higher than what it normally is in other organisms, they probably wouldn't be able to have this type of springy um, locomotion. But the hydrostatic skeleton, um, the coelom fluid, pushes so much on the cuticle, and the cuticle is also not like a rubber band, doesn't stretch forever, um, it will snap back. And so that's how we end up with this whip-like motion. Roundworms have a complete digestive tract with a mouth, pharynx, 
intestine, rectum, and anus. And food is moved through the digestive tract from the mouth all the way to the anus in a little bit different way than what we've seen previously. So in most of the cases we've talked about, um, food is moved through the digestive tract via cilia. But in roundworms, instead, the movement of them kind of projecting themselves forward is what's responsible for moving the food through their digestive tract. So as they're swimming, it's simultaneously pushing the uh, food through their digestive tract and the waste out of their anus. Additionally, food is moved through their digestive tract via compaction. So as they eat more food, it basically compacts the food that's already present in their digestive tract and then pushes it further and further down and then the waste out. So just the more food they eat, the more food they push down uh, through their digestive tract and then any waste that they don't need is pushed out of their body via their anus. And then additionally, roundworms sometimes have um, specialized feeding structures to allow them to get the nutrients from their host um, or for their, from their environment. And we can see this as one example in the stylet in the phytoparasitic roundworms. So the stylet can be seen here in this picture. And it's this needle-like structure um, that these uh, plant parasites have where they basically project this stylet into the plant cell so they can acquire nutrients or invade that cell. Um, there's a video at the end of this presentation that's a cartoon that shows you uh, how this process works. In addition to the stylet, some of them have uh, jaws, plates, or hooks that will help them to attach to their host and acquire whatever nutrients they need. So an example can be seen here. This is a hookworm, and the hookworm mouth has these plates. And these plates are responsible for attaching to the host and um, allowing them to effectively drink the host's blood. For the most part, roundworms are dioecious, meaning they have two separate sexes and they also undergo internal fertilization. And they've actually had to adapt a couple of different um, mechanisms to overcome the high hydrostatic pressure that's present within their bodies in order to effectively undergo sexual reproduction. Two of these are, one, the development of a spicule. So a spicule is a needle-like barb that's on the posterior region of the, wor the, male, sper the male worm. The male will use that barb to penetrate the vulva of the female, and um, this helps to deposit the sperm into the vulva and so that the sperm actually have a chance to um, make it to the egg. And this is thought to be uh, a, a way of counteracting the high hydrostatic pressure uh, you can see in the female body. Additionally, they have the development of an amoeboid sperm. So instead of sperm uh, moving towards the egg using flagella, as we see in like humans, instead their sperm um, use pseudopodia to basically crawl towards the egg instead. And both the spicule and the amoeboid sperm are thought to be mechanisms or adaptations that were developed in roundworms to counteract the uh, high hydrostatic pressure present in their bodies. The roundworm young undergo direct development. So they go from fertilized egg and they directly develop into miniature worms. Um, they, so they don't have a trochophore larvae. So keep that in mind. These are the only worms we've talked about that are not lophotrochozoans. They do not have a loph they don't have a trochophore and they don't have a lophophore, so they do not fit in that clade. Instead, their young are basically emerge as miniature versions of them, and then they undergo several molting stages until they reach full size as an adult. Most of the young are free swimming, but in some parasitic versions, um, so parasitic species, they are um, they require an intermediate host before they can become mature, and we'll talk about one of those examples in a second. All the adults of any particular species have the same number of somatic cells once they reach maturity. And this is referred to as utile or utilic um, animals, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago. And essentially, after the organism has become an adult, if they want to grow any further, then their cells will just enlarge. So they don't increase in cell number as they grow. Their cells they already have, which is a defined number of cells, will just become bigger in order for the organism to become bigger. So now that we've talked about what nematodes are and their anatomy, 
we're going to discuss a couple of um, species of parasitic nematodes that are particularly harmful for humans. We're going to start with Asc Ascardus lubricoides. And Ascardus lubricoides is thought to be infecting currently at least 1 billion people. So this is very, very prevalent. And they're very large worms in comparison to um, vast majority of nematodes, which are microscopic. You can get this infection through the consumption of contaminated produce and contaminated soil. So always, always wash your produce, fruits and veggies not just because of worms there are a lot of fungi and bacteria that are hanging around on your produce always wash your produce anyway so symptoms of this infection are abdominal pain allergic reactions and if there are enough worms you can get an intestinal blockage and that can be seen here this is actually an image a little different color this is an image of a pig's intestine that has basically been completely blocked by this these worms it's very rare that this uh, infection, this worm, will cause death in its host, but uh, it can cause some severe pain for those who, well, pain and discomfort for those who are afflicted. So the life cycle of Ascaris lubricoides, um, we're going to begin with the adult. So the adult is living in the small intestine of its host, and that's where it will release its eggs. The eggs are then excreted along with the feces of the person um, into soil or wherever it's at. Let's say a person defecates in the woods. Okay, it's located in the soil. Um, the eggs will then develop into juveniles, but those juveniles will stay within the egg until the egg is consumed by a new host. Once the eggs are consumed, the, um, the, the juveniles will leave the egg and then they will burrow uh, through your intestines into your blood or your lymph. And they will travel along the blood or lymph, uh, lymphatic fluid to the heart. From the heart, they will then migrate to your lung trachea. And this can cause pneumonia in people, um, if, especially if they stay there, if there are enough worms there. From the lung trachea, they will then go to the pharynx. And then from the pharynx, they are then swallowed again and go down to the gut pass through the gut and get into your intestines and that's where they will complete their development and that's where they'll stay and they'll release eggs and the whole process uh, starts again. Sometimes they can migrate to other parts of the body um, and this is through perforations in the intestinal lining so for the most part they're in the intestines but if you know situation gets bad enough they can travel to other places in your body like your lungs and things like that and cause severe issues. The next group we're going to talk about is Nectar americanus, and Nectar americanus is a type of hookworm, and you can see an example here. And they're called hookworms because their anterior end kind of curves dorsally, so it looks like they have a hook in their body shape. And these uh, hookworms also have these oral plates in their mouths that they use for cutting into the host's intestinal uh, tissue, and so they can suck the blood from their host. This can be problematic for afflicted individuals because these worms eat more blood than they actually need. They only halfway um, metabolize the blood that they consume. This can lead to anemia and lethargy in the afflicted individuals. And it's especially bad for children because this can result in mental and physical developmental issues. When we're looking at the life cycle, of the um, Nectar americanus, we're gonna start with the, the eggs. So eggs are removed um, via the feces. So someone goes and let's say defecates in the woods. Those eggs, once they get into the soil, the juveniles will uh, develop and then they'll leave the eggs and they will live in the soil consuming bacteria for an extended period of time. However time they need in order to find a new host. So let's say someone else is walking through the woods and they don't have proper footwear or they get splashed by this mud um, that is contaminated. The juveniles will then bury into the tissues of the new host and travel to the bloodstream. They will then travel through the bloodstream to the lungs. And then from here, the, the situation is very similar to what we saw in Ascaris lubricoides. They'll go um, from the lungs to the uh, pharynx or trachea be swallowed back down to the gut and then travel to the intestines. And then once they're into the intestines, that's where they will mature and they'll live for the rest of their lives, drinking all of your blood. 
Um, and then they'll make eggs, release their eggs in the feces, and the cycle will continue. Trichinella spiralis may be one of the more um, dangerous parasites we're going to talk about today. And it's because it causes a disease called trichinosis, and this can be potentially lethal in humans. Trichinella spiralis has a wide host range from humans to dogs to boars to bears. They're all viable uh, hosts. So when we're looking at the life cycle, let's begin with the uh, adult worms. So the adult worms basically take up um, residence in the mucosa of the small intestine of their host. And this is where they'll also give birth to live young. And those live young will then bury through the host tissues to get to the bloodstream. Once they get to the bloodstream, they're basically transported all over the body. And they'll, they can establish themselves in a variety of tissues. So pretty much any tissue in the organism is fair game for where they can end up uh, landing themselves. Once they land in a particular area, they will continue to bury into the tissues until they get to the skeletal muscle. Once at the skeletal muscle, they'll bury into a muscle cell and they'll basically insist there. And the juveniles will change the function of that cell. So the striated muscle cell will then be changed into essentially a nurse cell that will facilitate the development of this uh, parasite. And this is a result of changing the uh, gene expression of that muscle cell. And so it'll basically hang out in there, growing, living, until some other host eats the contaminated muscles of the in, uh, infected individual. So let's say that this is a um, uh, infected pig. So if you uh, then eat the contaminated, undercooked, or even raw uh, meat, muscle meat from the pig, you can then infect yourself. So once you consume the cyst, they'll travel to your intestine and then they'll bury into your intestinal wall and the cycle continues. So yet again, take home message, don't eat raw undercooked meat, um, always thoroughly cook your meat. Enterobilis vermicularis is a pinworm that is very common or relatively common in the US. Um, it's predicted that 30% of children and 16% of adults in the U.S. are infected with this worm at any given time. And many people may not know or realize that they're infected with this worm because there are little to no symptoms. There may be some itching, um, but other than that, people just may not even know that they have this worm until it's too late and they've passed it on to their family and friends and coworkers and everybody. So looking at the life cycle, we'll start with the adults in the large intestine. So the adults uh, take up residence in the large intestine in the cecum, and then the female, once they're ready to uh, deposit their eggs, will travel out of the uh, human's body and at night will lay their eggs in the t on the skin around the anus. And this will cause itching for the person. So if the person then goes and scratches that area, they now have the eggs underneath their fingernails and on their hands, as well as um, on their clothes or any type of material that becomes comes in contact with either their infected hands or with the, uh, air, the around the anus area. So always wash your hands, always wash your linens. Um, so then, once the um, the eggs are then transmitted to another person via consumption, so that person then doesn't go wash their hands and makes lunch for someone else or uh, touches something, that, that next host then consumes the eggs and then the eggs travel to the, um, the intestine and then they'll hatch and uh, in the duodenum and they'll mature in the large intestine. The infections of pinworms are detected using something called the scotch tape method. And essentially what will you do is if you go to the doctor and you think you have pinworms, they will take a piece of tape and stick it around your anus. And then they'll take that tape and remove it and put it on a slide. And you can see these um, eggs underneath the microscope. So these are uh, the eggs under a microscope. And if they see these, then they know that you have pinworms. 
Pinworms are pretty treatable with modern medicine. You just have to catch them early because they're very, very contagious. So um, if anyone ever thinks that they might have pinworms, go to the doctor um, as soon as you can. The last uh, group of worms we're going to talk about is the filarial worms. And this is not a specific, a specific species. This is more like a group. And um, I kept it as a group because there are so many of these worms that can infect humans and our pets that I just concluded them all. Um, when you get this type of infection, it can result in inflammation and instruction of the lymphatic system. And if people have been exposed multiple times, they can um, it develop something called elephantiasis. And that can be seen here in this image. This unfortunate gentleman um, has very uh, enlarged, malformed legs. And this is actually due to an infection with these worms. And um, what happens is this infection causes a buildup of connective tissue in the affected area as well as swelling. And that's why the uh, appendages begin to look this way. It's not always the legs, it can be the arms, it can be various other parts of the body, but uh, this can be very prevalent in places where people don't have adequate funds or resources to uh, treat themselves and uh, unfortunately have to live with this, this disease. Um, unlike the other worms we've talked about so far, the uh, filarial worms, they reside in the lymphatic system, not the digestive system. So looking at the life cycle, um, we'll begin with the young. So live young are released into the bloodstream or the lymphatic tissue, the lymphatic uh, fluid, and they're picked up by an arthropod. So a mosquito or a, uh, a fly or any other type of organism that uh, arthropod that feeds off the blood of others will come and drink the blood of an affected individual. And when they do that, they will uptake the uh, juveniles. The young will then go and uh, survive within the arthropod and develop within the arthropod until the arthropod then bites another potential host. Once the arthropod bites another host, it will um, the worms will travel through the proboscis or through the feeding structures into the new host bloodstream, and then they will travel to the lymphatic system and uh, the cycle will start all over again. So that's, and then in the lymphatic system is where they will mature. So I hope you made it through this lecture. I know it can be a little bit gross and a little bit scary, um, but this is really, really important, especially for those of you guys who uh, want to be epidemiologists or doctors or uh, want to study any sort of infectious disease. These types of things are real and very common issues for a lot of people. So, but anyway, um, go ahead and read chapter 18, 18 section, uh, section 18.1 and the introduction. Uh, we're only covering 18.1 because we're just going to talk about nematodes for now. And then also do the uh, chapter 18 smart book assessment. I've also included here some um, couple of videos. There's one here of a nematode swimming, which I talked about before. Also one of a nematode eating another nematode, uh, if you want to see that. There was a picture I put on the nutrition slide of, of this, but a video was really, really cool. You can actually see the, in <laughs> the internal fluids from one nematode being sucked into the body of the other one. So if you're into that type of stuff, definitely watch it. Um, another one that shows the infection of beet plants via um, nematodes, it's a cartoon, but it does show you how a uh, phytoparasitic nematode uses a stylet to penetrate the um, plant cells and basically feed off of those plant cells. And then there's another video here that talks about just the diversity and the importance of understanding nematodes in general. Alrighty, cool. See ya. You made it through the worms.